Tamriel is a land of contradictions. In the language of Old Meris, it translates to Dawn's Beauty, a name that signifies tranquility, a land where many diverse cultures and races intermingle, sharing discoveries and living in peace. It is the heart of Nern, where all living things yearn to be. The natives will make martyrs of themselves to protect its sacred soil, and the scattered peoples of the other continents envy its inhabitants. But while many call Tamriel Dawn's Beauty, others call it the Arena, for it is both the setting and the prize of every major conflict in the mortal realm of Mundus. A land as valuable as Tamriel breeds mortals who are willing to go to any lengths to defend it or perhaps to take more of it. An optimist may expect the races of Tamriel to share it benevolently, but a realist will argue that it is much more expedient to take what you want. Conflict, greed and ambition are staples of mortal existence, and they always lead to bloodshed. What's more, mortals can reconcile their savage tendencies as they kill to protect their homelands and their families. You could debate the nuances of war and peace until Satakal, the first serpent, eats the world and the cycle begins anew. But there is one other disposition that seems to rear its head startlingly often where mortals are concerned, and that's cruelty. Inflicting suffering on others is never a virtuous thing to do, but you can at least rationalize it in most instances. Perhaps your life is in danger Maybe you're starving and need to raid other lands. You could be driven by a desire for vengeance. You may have little choice in the matter, as you follow your lord or king or emperor's orders. But all honest mortals abhor cruelty, taking pleasure in inflicting suffering, hurting another for entertainment or personal gratification. Unfortunately, cruelty is rife on Tamriel, and it has been throughout history. Hey guys, it's Drew here, and welcome back to Fudge Muppet. I'm sure most of you listening to this are stuck in quarantine or self-isolation. Lucky for me, I've been training for this day for years. If isolating were a professional sport, I wouldn't need to make YouTube videos. What better way to lighten the mood in these turbulent times than by comparing the races of Tamriel to determine who is the most cruel and sadistic of the bunch? With the apocalypse on our doorstep, why not take our minds off it by going over the most atrocious things to happen to the people of Tamriel? So let's get started by listing off our honourable mentions, the races who've dabbled in the dastardly, but are far from the worst offenders. When Nern was formed, the Elnafe, the ancestors to men and elves, were scattered. The old Elnafe remained in Tamriel, while the wandering Elnafe found themselves on the continents of Akavir, Yakuda, and Atmora. Eventually, these rovers would return. And when they did, they came to a realm that was already populated. The Nedic migrations from Atmora settled with varying degrees of success, but the major documented migration was by Isgrimor and his followers. At first, they lived harmoniously alongside the Falmer, but after the Night of Tears, when the Snow Elves slaughtered almost every one of these human settlers, Isgrimor and his sons returned with vengeance on their minds. Together with the 500 companions, Isgrimor captured the northern province of Skyrim and systematically wiped out every snow elf he could find. By the time the conflict came to a close, at the Battle of the Mosring, the slopes of the mountains ran red with elf blood. It was a brutal and absolute revenge for the Night of Tears. Systematically wiping out a race is obviously cruel. I'm definitely not trying to justify it. But the context turns the story of Isgrimor's return from a sadistic genocide to one of vengeance and conquest. It's an example of the brutality of war, as opposed to cold-hearted sadistic cruelty. The same can be said for the Yakudan warrior waves. They came to Hammerfell and claimed the region for themselves. They saw the giant goblins of the Flinttooth tribe, who inhabited the Alakir at the time, as a threat to their ability to exist in safety. So they removed the goblins from Hammerfell. They also wiped out all of the needs and elves they encountered. Those they did not kill were conscripted as labourers. It is said they treated the Myrrh especially brutally, for they had a deep-seated hatred for elves after their thousand-year war with the left-handed elves of Yakuda. Once again, the cruelty of war is on full display, and once again, it's not so uncommon for the races of Tamriel to treat each other like this. The Malma Sea Elves of Pyandania are led by a deathless wizard named King Orgnum, who is driven by one goal and one goal alone. 
His only ambition is to conquer the Somerset Isles, and it is said that this is practically all the entire race lives for. Considering the fact that Orgnum is immortal, that goal is unlikely to ever change. The Pocket Guide to the Empire 3rd Edition says, The Malma of Pyandania were relentless in their drive to conquer Somerset. The Chronicler can scarcely find a year throughout the First and Second Eras, when the Malma did not ravage the coastlines of the Altma. There are villages in the central valleys of Somerset that have never seen battle, but so much blood has been spilled along the coasts, it is a wonder it is not stained permanently crimson. The Nords eradicated many snow elves, but their homeland was becoming inhospitable, and the slaughter at Sarfal was fresh on their minds. The Akudans too, for the most part, were fleeing the destruction of their former home, but the Sea Elves, thanks to their fanatical dictator, killed so many innocent High Elves in their countless failed attempts to claim the Isles, and what for? Some baseless claim to Somerset. Another race with a similar story to the Malma is the Kamal, though we know scarce little about them. The Kamal snow demons hail from mysterious Akavir, and the eponymous book tells us all we need to know about them. In the winter they remain frozen solid, but when summer comes, they thaw out and invade Tang Mo, but the brave monkey folk always drive them away. It seems they too have a single-minded hunger for conquest, only theirs is seemingly even more cruel when we look at their victims. The Tang Mo are described as being kind, brave and simple. These virtues don't endear them to the other races of Akavir. No, the other races view these virtues as weaknesses, and all of the other Akaviri nations have have, at one time or another, tried to enslave them. While we're on the topic of Akaviri nations, the Kamal clearly earned the name Snow Demon, but there's a crueler race inhabiting the eastern continent, and that race is the Saisi. The Snake Men have featured in Tamrielic history a lot across the eras. They were the Dragon Guard, and were a crucial part of Riemann's prosperous empire. Members of their race even ascended to the Imperial Throne, and the Dragon Guard would endure the centuries, becoming the Blades. But before they came to Tamriel, the Saisi had quite a brutal history. It is said the Snake Men completely wiped out the men of Akavir, but they didn't merely kill them, they also supposedly ate them. This could be figurative, or simply the product of generations of oratory embellishment. But there's good cause to believe the rumours, as mysterious Akavir posits that the Saisi were vampiric and drank blood, and would enslave goblins not only for their labour, but also as a fresh and perpetual source of sustenance. The text also says the Saisi attempted to eat all the dragons of Akavir too, and they enslaved the red dragons. Basically, the Saisi have a long history of massacring entire races, feasting on their blood, and enslaving those they don't kill. Blood may be drunk for sustenance, not simply pleasure, but that would serve as no consolation to their many victims. When discussing cruelty, we can briefly mention the Orcs and the Reachmen, but there's not a great deal to say. Their practices can be perceived as backwards and barbaric, like the Orcs with their raiding, and their blood prices, and their polygamous war chiefs, who can only be replaced if the challenger kills him. Or the Reachmen, with their savage Briarheart rituals, and their constant uprisings. But beyond being wild and brutish, the Orcs and Reachmen are more practical than cruel in their primitive, albeit bloody, customs. The Bosma may attract some attention when discussing the cruelest race. They are notorious across Tamriel for embracing cannibalism after all. But the Green Pact is an honourable way of life in Valenwood. The Wood Elves believe they must waste no part of what they kill, and they eat meat in order to preserve Ifra's natural wonders. But with the exception of the Green Pact, the Bosma are known for being the most pacifistic race on Tamriel. Not that they have much competition, and they are also considered to be the most peaceful. We have three more on Honourable mentions, two races you'll be very familiar with, and one you may not know so much about. The first of these races isn't particularly cruel in war, and they are the antithesis of primitive. Yet one of their societal practices is remarkably cruel, if it is true at all. I'm referring to the Ultima of Somerset. The High Elves pride themselves on being refined and cultured. They're a proud people, and to outsiders, they come off as arrogant and snobbish. Yet for all their posturing about being the most advanced and the most sophisticated, the Pocket Guide to the Empire First Edition, which is generally considered to be a very reliable source, suggests that the High Elves have normalised eugenic infanticide. This particular claim is documented by the Imperial Emissary, Eric of Guy 
who was undeniably biased and never had anything positive to say about any elven races. Either way, his claim is as follows. High elves consider themselves to be the only perfect race. Over hundreds of generations, they have bred themselves into a racially pure line and are now almost identical to one another in appearance. The theory that the high elves do not reproduce as quickly or as often as humans is false. Rather, and to my horror, they kill nine out of 10 babies born to them in their obsession for purity. As with all of the races so far, you can attribute a motive to their horrific deeds, and therefore, they aren't cruel in the sense that they take pleasure from inflicting suffering. But murdering newborn babies simply because they do not meet purity standards is unthinkably wicked. But beyond the assurances of one rather xenophobic human, we can't actually guarantee that this is true at all, and I doubt its accuracy. One thing we can't doubt is just how much Morrowind thrives as a result of slave labour. Many races have utilised slavery. We've seen a couple of examples already, from the Yakudans to the Saisi. But for the Dunma, slave trading has historically been a fundamental part of Morrowind's economy, and they consider its practice to be their ancient right. Despite imperial efforts to outlaw slavery, the Dunmer ensured that they were exempt from this when joining the Empire. The Dark Elves predominantly trade in Argonian and Khajiit slaves, though humans, goblins and lesser elves are not off the table. The Dunmer viewed most outsiders as inferior, and this prevented the slave trade from being hindered by moral dilemmas. Slavery was popular all over the province, but it is most prevalent on the southern salt rice plantations. The Great House Dress are conveniently situated on the fertile Dashan Plains, and their close proximity to Northern Black Marsh ensures a steady supply of new slaves. The importance of slave labour to this house in particular is clear enough from a glance at their banner, which displays a set of shackles. The slave trade operated for almost all of Morrowind's Dunmeri history, but was finally and officially outlawed by King Helseth in the late Third Era. Last of the honourable mentions before we tackle our top three cruelest races are the Dreg. In your adventures across Tamriel's coasts, you may have encountered this crustaceous race. They spend most of their lives in the sea, but for one year, every dreg emerges from the water to breed on land, in a process known as Carvinism. During this time, their lust replaces their usual intelligence, and they will attack any living thing they see. To modern mortals, the dreg appear to be simple-minded beasts, incapable of cruelty. But the Dreg are an ancient race, and once upon a time, they were among the most intelligent races of Mundus. Mankar Cameron, the leader of the enigmatic cult of the Mythic Dawn, wrote about the Dreg in his commentaries. The Mundux Turin, the Mundus, was once ruled over solely by the tyrant Dreg kings, each to their own dominion, and border wars fought between their slave oceans. They were akin to the time totems of old, yet evil and full of mockery and profane powers. No one that lived did so outside of the sufferance of the dregs. And Vivek, a poet whose writings were even more esoteric than Mankar's, had this to say about the dreg in his 36 lessons. When the dregs ruled the world, the Daedroth prince Molag Bal had been their chief. Vivek proceeds to talk about the ruddy man, the monstrous reanimated carapace of Molag Bal's crustaceous form. But his writings, despite being profoundly unreliable, lends credence to Mankar's claims that, in another age, the Dreg Kings had in fact ruled Nern. And if an aspect of Molag Bal had been their chief, it's not hard to imagine how cruel they would have been. Molag Bal is the Daedric Prince of enslavement, domination, corruption, torment, brutality, and the list goes on. Mankar Cameron served Mehrunes Dagon, the Prince of Destruction, and even he portrayed the Dreg as tyrannical. The Dreg could quite possibly be the cruelest race to have ever set foot on Tamriel, but they ruled the world in another Kalpa. And for those of you unfamiliar with the term Kalpa, the simplest way to put it is that a Kalpa is a cycle of the universe. Depending on what doctrine you adhere to, perhaps Satakal the World Serpent eats itself, or maybe Alduin the World Eater eats the world. However you dress it, it's basically the cycle of time starting anew. The Dawn Era serves as the transitionary period between the old and new Kalpas, and when the Morefic Era begins, the new Kalpa commences. Because the Dreg ruled the world in another Kalpa, it's impossible to know the details of their rule, and thus we can only speculate on how cruel they truly were. 
But now it's time to talk about our three cruelest races, each of which has left a lasting impact on present day Tamriel. The first is one we all know well, the subterranean innovators, the pioneers of the universe's most perverse perplexities. The Dwemer defied the gods and built magnificent machines that demonstrated steam-powered sentience. I could go on for hours about the achievements of this fascinating race, but we're here to talk about their less admirable deeds. If you'd like to hear all about the dwarves, I'll leave a link to my dedicated video on them in the description below. The Dwemer took pride in meddling with divine forces and technologies not meant for mortals, and they flew so close to the sun that their bronze constructs reached their metaphorical melting points. Their ingenuity and ambition led to their downfall, but it also led them to treat another race with unthinkable cruelty. It's a part of their history that I'm sure they'd rather was forgotten entirely, but it happened and it proved that even the most intelligent of creatures has the capacity for wickedness. When the Nords eradicated the majority of the Snow Elves, and when all hope was lost following the death of their leader the Snow Prince, the survivors knew they had no option but to flee. At this time, history was written by the victors, and the Chroniclers were now human, not Elven. As far as the Nords were concerned, the remaining Snow Elves were scattered, or better yet, slain. But the truth was discovered by a Falmer historian named Ursa Ufrax, who explored and studied Skyrim before documenting his findings. He concluded that the twisted Falmer that inhabit the darkest depths of Skyrim are indeed the Snow Elves of legend, and there is a wealth of evidence to support his discoveries. He wrote that, when the Snow Elf host was shattered on that fateful day, it did not simply disperse, it descended into the earth deep underground, for the Falmer sought sanctuary in the most unlikely of places, Blackreach, far beneath the surface of Skyrim, in the legendary realm of the Dwemer themselves. After their defeat by the Nords, the Dwarves of old agreed to protect the Falmer, but at a terrible price, for these Dwemer did not trust their Snow Elf guests, and forced them to consume toxic fungi that once grew deep underground. As a result, the Snow Elves were rendered blind. Not only were the Snow Elves unfamiliar with the subterranean realm of the Dwarves, but they were poisoned gravely. The fungi not only blinded the Snow Elves, but it either directly caused, or at the very least facilitated the mental degeneration of the race. Ursa continues, Soon, the majestic Snow Elves were rendered powerless. They became the Dwarves' servants, and then their slaves. But the Dwemer's treachery was so deep, so complete that they made the fungi an essential part of the Falmer's diet. This guaranteed the weakness of not only their current Falmer thralls, but their offspring as well. The Snow Elves for time eternal would be blind. The weakened Falmer rebelled against their captors, but they could not hope to beat the intelligent dwarves who built these underground cities. When the Dwemer disappeared, the Snow Elves were victorious, though hardly as a result of their own actions. What the Dwarves did to the Falmer refugees was heinous. Understandably, they were reluctant to trust their surface-dwelling guests. But one could argue that it would have been more humane for the refugees to try their luck hiding in Skyrim or crossing the border to Cyrodiil or Resdane. So the Dwarves could not hide behind the claim that they were the best option for the Snow Elves who wished to live. There's no doubt that the zealous Dwarves saw an opportunity when the refugees came to their golden gates in search of sanctuary. They doubtless benefited greatly from enslaving the blinded Falmer, and there are a few crimes more cruel in the history of Tamriel. But the Dwemer only took the bronze medal, so let's talk about a race that is infinitely more cruel than the Dwarves. If you've ever bathed with a bar of that exotic slowed soap, then you are officially complicit to child murder. But then again, you might just be doing the universe a service by preventing any more slowed from entering adulthood. Behold the most vile, corpulent, acrid creature to ever walk or squirm across the face of Nern. The Slowed are a race of amphibious, slug-like beasts, hailing from the coral kingdoms of Frass. And if you haven't heard of them, then consider yourself lucky. If you'd like a complete explanation of this repulsive, yet admittedly intriguing race, then check the description for a link to Scott's video on the Elder Scrolls' chunkiest, thickest boys. Unlike the Dwemer, and most of the other races listed so far, the Slowed aren't simply guilty of the odd cruelty. No, practically every facet of this race's society and culture revolves around heartless, cruel, and downright evil practices. The Slowed 
would supposedly do not experience emotion, and that explains a lot. Appearance and personality aside, the slow do not look down upon blasphemy, theft, torture, kidnapping, murder, or even genocide. They break laws whenever they calculate it's in their best interests. They do not perceive or honor friendship or loyalty in the familiar human terms, except for a cheerful affinity for those who defeat them or trick them in any endeavor. The adult form does not apparently reproduce, and shows no interest in the fate of its offspring. They are a godless race, but will serve a Daedra Lord if they themselves can benefit from the arrangement. They practice necromancy openly and often, and will kill their offspring without compunction in order to turn their young into slowed soap. This soap is not used for washing. No, the slow don't care for hygiene. They use the soap in their necromantic rituals. You get the picture, they're pretty reprehensible. But the reason the slow takes second place is because of the Frashen Plague. It was ever present, ever penetrating. It seeped into every person, every creature, every drop of water, seeking to be quenched. The afflicted drank themselves to corpulence with each passing day, until their bones cracked under their bulging flesh. The Frashen Plague, colloquially known as the Slug Famine, was a terrible pandemic that ravaged Tamriel in either First Era 2200 or First Era 2260, depending on the source. It's believed that the plague wiped out half of the population of the Iliac Bay region, where the disease was at its worst, and other scholars have even speculated that it wiped out half the population of the whole of Tamriel. It reached as far as elsewhere, it wiped out entire cultures, and decimated entire populations. It is potentially the greatest tragedy to befall Tamriel, and as the name suggests, it originated in the Coral Kingdoms. But what seals the deal is not that it originated in Frass, but that it was artificially created by the Slode, with the intention of massacring countless Tamrielites. The Slode were punished for this egregious crime, as the All Flags Navy gathered and sailed to Thras, slaughtered all the Slode they could find, and with great unknown magics, sunk their coral kingdoms into the sea. But no amount of retaliation would compare with the devastation of the Frashen Plague. And now for our final race, the cruelest race to set foot on Tamriel. The Slode are a tough act to follow, and whoever this race is will never be able to boast the same death toll as the Slode and their slug famine. But we chose the word cruel because the race needs to not only have committed horrific crimes against other mortals, but they needed to take pleasure in it. Cruelty is willfully causing pain or suffering to others. Cruelty is feeling no concern about it. Cruelty is relishing in the torment of your victims, and the Aelids of Cyrid were the cruelest. The Aelids are an ancient and enchanting race. They built the first empire on Tamriel, and while they fell from greatness long ago, the remnants of their glorious past can be seen all over the heartland of Cyrodiil. Once again, if you'd like to learn more about the race, I have a comprehensive video covering them on the channel, and I'll also link it below. But this once prosperous people dominated the region for long enough to see their sophisticated culture deteriorate. This wondrous empire revered starlight, and built citadels of unrivaled size and beauty. The Aelids were responsible for building the White Gold Tower, modelled in the image of the Adamantine Tower, and it has been the centrepiece of Tamriel's history ever since. They were the forerunners for much of Tamriel's arcane knowledge. They determined that the stars were the link between Mundus and Aetherius. They built brilliant wells to harness this magical energy, and they cut Welkind and Vala stones from meteoric glass to serve as receptacles for this harvested energy. Without the Aelids, we wouldn't have the Alteration School of Magic. But it is through religion that the Aelids set about their cultural atrophy. At first, they were devoted to the same Adric gods the other Aldma worshipped. However, they were unique in their veneration for the former pupil of Magnus, Meridia, who they called Merignunda. She became a Daedric prince, but it was not the Lady of Light who corrupted the Heartland Elves. Many splinter religions emerged in the Empire of the Aelids. Many were said to be godless, but many more were described as Daedra loving. Judging by the changes in Aelid culture, there were likely popular cults dedicated to princes like Molag Bal that gained a lot of traction. 
According to Frastus of Elenhir, the decorated imperial scholar, the Aelids made no distinction between good and bad Daedra. Indeed, even some of the more heinous princes received mass veneration, especially when their worship was adopted and endorsed by the Aelid kings and aristocrats. Widespread Daedra worship among the Heartland Elves was particularly ill news for the tribes of Nedic humans, who were then arriving in Tamriel. The Aelids enslaved the immigrant tribes of men, at first occasionally, but then systematically, and the Nedic people found themselves subject to masters who, in many cases, worshipped the princes, including those who encouraged slavery, domination and cruelty. So like so many other races, the Aelids normalised the use of slave labour to grow their empire. But the ending of that description from Frastus is what sets the Aelids apart, and we even have a primary source attesting to the horrific treatment of slaves during the reign of the Aelid Sorcerer Kings. In his memoirs, the legendary demigod and son of Kain, Morahaus, described the slave years of Aelid oppression. He says, Men were given over to the lifting of stones, and the draining of the fields, and the upkeep of temple and road. These tasks were not uncommon for slaves, and if this were the Aelid race's most damning indictment, then they wouldn't take first place in the list. But the Aelids began torturing their slaves for mass entertainment. Sources suggest this wasn't just the minority who took pleasure in such gruesome games and sickening sports. It was a flourishing industry. Morehouse goes on to say, the slaves were given over to become art tortures for strange pleasures, as in the wailing wheels of Vindazel and the gut gardens of Cersen, and flesh sculpture, which was everywhere among the slaves of the Aelids in those days. Or worse, the realms of the Fire King Hadhul, where the begetting of drugs drawn from the admixture of daedrons, into living hosts let one inhale new visions of torment, and children were set aflame for nighttime tiger sport. The Daedra loving Aelids delighted in the macabre. Cruelty was a booming business. As Morahouse states, slave torture was an art and a sport, funded by the highest echelons of Aelid society and enjoyed by the masses. How many slaves died in the wailing wheels and the gut gardens can't possibly be measured. I could say with confidence that the death toll would be greatly overshadowed by the number of lives lost to the Frashen Plague. But the systematic and elaborate torture of slaves without practical purpose and the widespread appeal of sadism which manifested as visceral exhibitions of anguish and spectacles of mortal suffering is cruel beyond comprehension, and that is why the Aelids are the cruelest race to set foot on Tamriel. I hope you enjoyed the video guys, thanks so much for watching, I've been Drew, this has been Fudge Muppet, stay home, stay safe, watch YouTube, play video games, and I'll see you in the next one.